OK, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from. I'm glad you could all make it. Thanks very much for signing up to our to our webinar this morning. Um, you'll be pleased to know that um, on the whole, you won't be hearing very much from me. Um, the experts will be taking over. I'm just doing a, an introduction to the day. Uh, the webinar is uh, organised by North uh, in partnership with, with Ambre, who are the experts that are going to tell us everything that we need to know. Security status is the, is the title, security requirements and the current situation in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, we in North, uh, in loss prevention and in the claims team, get an awful lot of inquiries still uh, about about this region. A lot of those times uh, when we get these inquiries, we do turn to people like uh, Steve and Robert Ambre to, to get some of the latest information. So hopefully this will be of interest uh, to everybody. Just a couple of rules for me before we start. If possible, uh, can we try and remain on mute? Uh, we'd get some echo and some background office noise makes it difficult for the presenters uh, to maintain their concentration and for everybody to hear clearly what the presenters are saying. So if we could just try and stay on top of that, that'd be that'd be great. Thank you. Um, we will have a Q and A session at, at the end. There's a there's a some time allotted for that at the end of the presentation, but feel free to type uh, your questions down as we go along, and I will read them out at the end in the Q and A uh, section. Just to let you all know, this is being recorded uh, and we will send a copy of the recording to those that registered. So all of the, all of you uh, that are here at the moment and those that registered that couldn't make it at the last minute, uh, we'll get a copy of the recording uh, so you can rewatch it. There'll be a better introduction coming up, but just as I said, we'll be joined by Ambre today, uh, Rob Peters and Steve Harwood. They will introduce themselves. Uh, as as we move on, but uh, thank you uh, in advance for their time and their efforts, not just in this webinar, but uh, in general. Uh, as as we've as I've discussed, we do uh, have many inquiries on this uh, kind of subject, and these guys are extremely helpful for us. I uh, somehow managed to get my uh, face and name onto the panel, even though I have very little input other than this. Uh, so. Uh, my name is John. I am the loss prevention executive in the North of England um, PI club, and I am going to shut mine down. And Rob, if you want to take over. I can see that, Rob, but you're still muted. Oops. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you. Mate. Thanks. Lovely. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. And first, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to speak to you all. Um, we hope this will be an informative uh, session. We hope uh, to get lots of uh, questions and we hope to be able to answer. Uh, all of them as well for you. Um, I'm going to first of all hand over to uh, Steve. Steve's our Director of Crisis Management um, and then I will um, jump straight into the presentation. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you very much Robert and thank you very much John for um, um, in inviting us to um, present here today. Um, yeah, I'm the Crisis Director for Ambry. Um, I've been in and around um, crisis management, business resilience, um, security risk management for at least the last 18 years. Uh, and 10 of those years I've been dealing predominantly in um, kidnap and ransom um, recovery in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, so um, I think that there's a pretty good wealth of experience that I will be able to answer most questions that you, you or um, um, any of your colleagues may have um, within your company. Um, I'll leave it there for now and um, hand back to Rob. So I'm our senior intelligence analyst. I've focused on West Africa uh, since joining Ambre, and I run our Guardian service, which is a transit risk assessment, and it is also monitoring after that transit risk assessment ahead of the route for any um, risks that we see. Uh, I've also developed various intelligence methodologies, which I brought um, to Ambre. Um, this is the um, this is what we're going to cover in this session. Uh, there's quite a lot to cover, so I, I will um, 
keep this moving at pace uh, so we do get uh, a good session for questions and answers at the end. So first of all, um, with the Gulf of Guinea and the trends which we saw over the course of 2021, there was a 51% reduction in reported incidents in the region, and there was a 54% reduction in the reported kidnappings. So actually what we're seeing is a lower amount of activity on the water, not an increase in effectiveness of the pirates. In 2020, there was a record number of incidents. Um, so why have they fallen? In part, we assess that this is likely because of an uptick in armed security. So who is being targeted? In 2021, tanker crews were still the most commonly targeted, the purport, but the proportion of tankers fell. So you can see the proportion of tankers in tw are targeted in between 2015 to 2020 on the left and 2021 on the right. So it's gone from 37% in the previous years to just 28% this year. And you can see that other types of vessels have seen their crews targeted um, more often as a proportion of incidents, particularly container ship crews and bulk carrier crews. So in terms of container ships, historically, they have taken less armed security when they've moved through the region. In the beginning of 2021, container ships made of roughly 5% of AMBRE's SEB work in the region. None attacked during 2020 or 2021 had engaged SEVs. And that's even those within the Nigerian EEZ. So you can see on the map, the blue points within the Nigerian EEZ. I'll just point this out for you so you can orientate yourselves. This is the Nigerian EEZ. And you can see the dark blue points are where container ships have been attacked. In terms of bulk carriers, historically bulkers have engaged SEVs more than container ships, but less than tankers. So in terms of an armed security engagement rate, we see them engaging security, armed security, three times more than container ships. Now, going into 2022, I'm going to make a bold forecast that there could actually be more attacks on container ships this year than there are tankers. Now, this may not come to pass because actually we've seen cont container shipping taking notice of this trend. So they're taking more armed security. And in terms of AMBRE, where I have uh, excellent statistics, I can say that container shipping SEV work has doubled uh, in the last year. Um, and also two large container shipping companies have since enrolled their fleets calling the Gulf of Guinea on AMBRE Guardian, the transit risk assessment and monitoring service. Now, why was there a reduction um, over 2021? Um, we did see increased Nigerian SEV supply, and this has led to lower daily rates for higher quality vessels. When I talk about higher quality, what I mean to say is, and they are ballistic, and they also have higher reliability, so they're less likely to break down during a, an escort task. In 2021, offshore Nigeria, we tracked in excess of 70 active SEVs on average, um, conducting at least two tasks per month. There are three key indicators that SEVs deter pirates. So the first one is a case study. In December 2020, the LPG carrier Verizane was approached, and it was approached in this sort of area here, but it had engaged an SEV called the MV Selena. It wasn't an AMBRE SEV, but we tracked them and how they responded. So the SEV was at first 2.4 nautical miles behind the Verizane. Then as the speedboat approached the Verizane, the SEV closed within one cable of the Verizane. And all the while the Verizane was conducting evasive maneuvers. The pirates gave up trying to target her, and instead they went a little further north, but within sight of the Verizane and boarded a tanker called the New Ranger, which had not engaged armed security. Now, we also see that a higher proportion of incidents involve vessels without security, and this 
increased in 2021, as you can see from the, the, the bars here. What we also see as an indicator of this is the location of incidents has dramatically changed in the last over the last few years. Only 28% of incidents in 2021 were in Nigerian waters. This was lower than any year since at least 2015, where we bring our database back to. And we think this is because of SEV take up. This is the map between, of incidents between 2018 to 2020. Over this period, 49% of incidents were in Nigerian waters. And then if I go back another three year period, 95% of incidents were in Nigerian waters. So if I go back and just flick through very quickly. This is since 2015, we've seen dramatic change. Now, in terms of an impact, um, I want to start with a rather sobering slide. So between four to 12% of incidents since 2015 have involved a crew member death or injury. Most will have heard of the Mozart. I've put on top of this slide the title Game Changer, because at the time the industry was describing it as a game changer. In January 2021, the container ship was attacked in the Sao Tom and Principe EEZ. This is the incident point for her. The crew gathered in the citadel, but the pirates breached an outer fire door and then cut a hole into the citadel through a reinforced door using ship's power tools. They actually burnt through these tools as they were using them. Once they had breached the citadel, the pirates fired shots into the citadel where the crew were gathered and the second mechanic and two was killed and two others were injured. The captain subsequently opened the citadel and 15 crew members were kidnapped. Now, not enough change has happened. In 2021 ended with another crew member injured on board the container ship Tonsberg. A pilot started to shout through a lounge window. The crew member who was in the lounge, quote, instinctively started to run and was shot in the leg by the pirate. Now, there is less chance of crew being shot if they comply with the pirates. But as the case of the Tonsberg shows, they need to be aware that the pirates are on board, else they might instinctively try to run. They need to be prepared mentally that they're on board. These figures are only counting crew members killed or injured. The loss of life and injuries are, are much higher if you include armed security teams and Navy teams. Also in terms of the impact, of course, we'll look at the number of uh, kidnappings and the amount of people kidnapped per kidnapping. So even though the number of kidnappings fell, the number of crew kidnapped per incident grew on average, more than six crew members were kidnapped in each kidnapping event. There were two incidents in which 15 crew members were kidnapped. And in each of those cases, the crew had gathered into the citadel and the citadel was breached. In each of those cases, the pirates only used one speedboat. And injured crew were left behind. Now, the increase in the number of crew kidnapped per kidnapping has, has increased over time, as you can see from the chart. And this could lead to higher ransom costs per kidnapping. Generally speaking, the more crew members kidnapped, the higher the overall ransom, though there are diminishing returns for every additional crew member captured. And that's thanks in part to negotiating teams, and we'll cover that with Steve later. There's not a linear relationship between the amount of crew kidnapped and a ransom uh, which is settled on. It looks more like a curve. The ransoms do not include the costs, of course, to the crew and family for counselling, dispatching crew to the vessel once crew have been kidnapped from that vessel, Scheduled delays to that vessel, 
and or, or the kidnap for ransom responder costs. So an awful lot of costs involved with an incident. Now, on to the next uh, section, we're going to look at boys' risk assessments. Uh, these are a core parts of what we do in Ambre. So alongside our core business of providing SEVs, providing um, maritime security liaison officers, providing uh, Navy guards in this region, and providing Guardian. Um, alongside each of those, we perform voyage risk assessments. So how do we do it? Um, we try and avoid higher risk areas. So there is no single HRA in the Gulf of Guinea, the ITF, uh, shipping companies, um, the insurance industry, flag states and charterers have their own zones. Now, what we've done is we've tried, we've recognised that there is a trade-off between the predictability of these HRAs, so whether or not an incident falls inside a HRA, and the size of HRA. Of course, if you have a huge HRA, it's likely to be highly predictable, but actually, it's not very useful to have a huge HRA, especially if you're like us and involved in day to day operations and trying to get ships into ports safely in this area. So we've generated our own high risk areas. We do this using geospatial analytics and the methodology we've tested hundreds of times. Um, we apply science to this. Um, and these better balance area size and predictability. So, for example, the JWC's area predicted 4% fewer incidents than ours, despite having a 20% larger area. And you can see this on the uh, chart we have here. So you can see our area here, and you can see the change in area size. So, for example, the ITF's area, um, the extended risk zone is huge compared to ours, obviously, um, but it only predicts 9% more incidents. In addition to our high risk areas, um, we actually have high risk areas for different times of day as well. So we route vessels differently at different times of day. You can see here that incidents take place in different areas at different times of day, particularly in territorial waters, and um, there is more risk usually at night. So if you look at, for example, Lome, I'll just highlight this. This is Lome, Cotonou, Douala and Duendo or Libreville. The threat also changes over the course of the year. So you can see here in the chart the number of incidents over um, the 12 months of the year over, uh, since 2015. So piracy is seasonal. The threat peaks around the Niger Delta's dry season between November to February, and there is an increased threat which lasts through to May. This seasonality of attacks influences the volume of incidents offshore, but the volume of attacks in territorial waters remains fairly stable across the year. Note that we're not dealing with the Indian Ocean here. Even between June to October in the wet season, incidents do still take place hundreds of miles offshore Nigeria. We also consider handrailing secured terminals and ports. When I mean handrailing, I'm talking about routing closer to these places. And we'll do that even with SEVs because then there is strength in depth. What I find is that there is a misperception in the industry around the time it takes to respond to an incident if you're attacked. So in the image over on the right, you can see some incidents and you can see the time in hours it took to respond to these incidents. The response could be an SEV coming alongside the vessel or a naval vessel coming alongside the um, vessel, or it could include um, 
Navy personnel boarding that vessel and giving the all clear to the crew to come out of the, of the citadel. So we've seen response times of over 20 hours, 70 nautical miles from the nearest offshore terminal. So for example, with this incident here, nearest offshore terminal was Bonga. That was 70 nautical miles distance. Now, there are some things which you can do to help improve that response time. So in that particular instant, that vessel was not displaying its AIS. It triggered its SSAS, but authorities subsequently reported the wrong position. The LRIT readout um, was then shared with Ambre because Ambre was supporting um, this client with kidnap for ransom response. Um, but that was shared later in the day. Using the LRIT readout and the data around the currents, the current direction, current speed, I instructed an SEV to pass by and they were the first to find her. The Italians then deployed a warship towards that area and found her and the Nigerian Navy dispatched two SEVs to her. And even if you're displaying AIS closer to a terminal, the response times can still be long. It took 12 and a half hours for the Nigerian Navy to give the all clear to a container ship attacked 40 nautical miles southwest of Aegina. I'll just point this out to you. So there's the incident and this is Aegina terminal. However, in both cases, the pirates boarded the vessels, but they did not kidnap crew. And this speaks to BMP measures, which we'll come to in the next section. What I'll say is, even if you have arranged an SEV, the response will depend on the SEV supplier's control of that SEV. So if it's owned and operated by the same company, like Ambre has owned SEVs down there, um, it can be easier for us to coordinate a response. So for example, one vessel booked an SEV into Nigeria. It was attacked in international waters before it reached its RV position. I'm talking about this incident here. It was outside of Nigerian waters, just outside. At the time of the attack, their SEV was only 45 nautical miles away and it was drifting. This wasn't an Ambre SEV. It took the SEV eight and a half hours to reach that vessel. And in that time, the pirates broke into the Citadel and kidnapped 15 crew members. The pirates had remained on board for eight hours. Bear in mind that the SEV took eight and a half hours to reach them. Had the SEV intervened earlier, because they were in the, the crew was in the Citadel, when the pirates didn't have hostages, they might have been able to prevent a kidnapping. So my key message from this is BMP buys time. As we have seen, even long responses do not necessarily result in a kidnapping. It didn't result in a kidnapping here or here. But we have seen response times within half an hour of incidents and yet crew members have been kidnapped. So in the case of the Tonsberg, there was a, was a response by the Danish Halo within half an hour of the incident. But the crew was still kidnapped. And that was because, although it had responded, by that time, the pirates held hostages. So another factor we consider when we route our vessels is we give them a BMP survey and we ask them to fill that out and we get a good idea of how good their BMP is and we route them accordingly. So in terms of BMP, I'll cover this in two slides. The first slide is the primary layer and the second slide covers the secondary and then the last layer of defence. So freeboard is key. Since 2015, we have not had any incident reports um, of a vessel boarded with a freeboard of more than 10.4 metres. Where disclosed in 2020 to 2021, 76% of vessels approached with a less than 9.5 metre freeboard and without armed security were boarded, 76%. Time and time again, razor wire is not the right strength. There is not enough of it. 
so it doesn't um, have enough uh, coils and it is not secured properly. So we've seen pirates are cutting it with wire cutters, indicating it's not strong enough. Pirates are handling it without gloves, which indicates there's not enough of it. And they are pulling it away from railings, which means which indicates that razor wire is not being secured properly. And so razor wire is delaying pirates by seconds in some cases. We highly recommend anti-climb plastic barriers. These can increase your effective freeboard by another 1.2 meters. And in addition, they make it harder for pirates to hook a ladder on. If you imagine these ladders, these ladder hooks are made out of tree branches and tied to a, a ladder. Pirates will struggle to latch these onto um, anti-climb plastic barriers. And this will be even harder if the crew have noticed the pirates approach and if they have increased speed and conduct, started to conduct evasive maneuvers. It should be much harder for the pirates to uh, fix these ladders on. Uh, and we have our own preferred supplier um, who can provide these. Higher risk speeds are obviously going to reduce risk. And now this is because a 20 knot vessel uh, will be in an exposed area for half the time of a 10 knot vessel. However, um, pirates have been ha have boarded vessels at high speed, conducting evasive maneuvers such as the Mozart. So we tracked the Mozart as it performed an evasive maneuver at 21.9 knots. I would say that maneuvers and speed can force mistakes. We've seen pirates make mistakes. They've dropped ladders before and evasive maneuvers and higher speeds will make that more likely. Now, in terms of the secondary and last layers, so when we look at our data, once on board, pirates kidnapped crew in 63% of cases between 2020 to 2021. So I would encourage you to look up how quickly a disc cutter can cut through steel. It's seconds, if not minutes, if you have the right discs, the right blades. The Citadel is not the first and last layer of defence on board. There needs to be a series of defensive layers, one after the other, which delays the pirates. The ship should be locked down in the HRA. Any unnecessary access doors should be closed and locked. If you have bars, they should be applied. Chocks should also be used. Windows should be closed and shutters applied if you have them. And hardening is as strong as its weakest point. So for example, on one vessel attacked in 2021, once the pirates failed to get into an access door on a lower level, uh, they climbed a drain pipe to access the bridge. So it's looking at your risk holistically around the vessel. 2021 was notable for citadels failing twice. Both times, the pirates used power tools to cut through the doors, including a seven, seven millimeter thick steel door. Those power tools were the ship's own power tools. The pirates haven't brought on to on board their own power tools, as far as we know. In one of those cases, the crew had turned off the main electrics, but the pirates wired up the power tools to, the, to an emergency light above the door. Pirates have threatened to use explosives, but there is no evidence that they have used them. So there were some reports uh, last year of pirates using explosives. There is no evidence for that, although we have heard uh, video, we have heard audio of pirates threatening to use that. They do bring sledgehammers with them to break through doors. We, now, the question is, in the future, given how successful they've been in cutting through citadels using power tools, why aren't they bringing them with them? That could be something that they do next if they find that they can't break through citadels 
regularly. Now, we recommend enhancing critical points of failure with ballistic protection plates. On to the next section, due diligence on security provision. Sometimes this can be um, quite confusing. You'll hear um, different things for different providers. This is Ambrose. Um, this is Ambrose's uh, points. Um, what I'll also say is when I give you the due diligence, you don't have to just trust us. After all, we are a security provider. Um, you could look at, for example, a Shell's list of approved providers, which, of course, we're one of them. So in terms of compliance, uh, to operate in Nigerian waters, the PMSC must have a Nigeria Security and Civil Defence Corps certificate, an NSCDC certificate. This certifies that they are a private security company in Nigeria, and they must, must also hold a memorandum of understanding with the Navy themselves or partner with a company which holds an MOU with the Navy. That MOU uh, says, to, um, says to you that the Nigerian Navy is comfortable putting their personnel on board that vessel. Now, to hold the NSCDC certificate, PMSCs will have to meet other criteria which you might have heard about. So, for example, a certificate of incorporation as a Nigerian company, um, a tax identification number, of course, so they're paying, so you can see that they're paying tax in Nigeria, and they'll need local shareholders, and one of those needs to be a senior naval officer. Of course, it, also, if they're operating their own SEV, SEVs, the company needs to hold a NAMASA uh, shipping, shipping license, and NAMASA being the Nigerian Maritime Administration Safety Agency. Um, in the map, I've shown you some engagement positions of SEVs. So you'll see some engagements at, actually around the terminals. Of course, that's where they pick up and drop off um, clients. But also, I've got a lot of points uh, offshore Nigeria where SEVs are picking up uh, clients. And you'll notice that my shaded area in the Nigerian EZ, about a third of these engagements involve picking up clients outside of Nigerian waters. And there's a problem with that, which is the Nigerian Navy are on board these SEVs and they might have to use rules of force um, against, uh, against vessels in these areas. So if they're using lethal force in these areas and shooting perhaps dead um, some suspects, um, there is a jurisdictional problem here if they're doing it in the Nigerian and Sao Tom joint development zone, for example, in Sao Tom's waters, for example, even in Togo's waters and Benin's waters. There is a problem with that. So we, um, we ensure that our tasks are compliant by giving uh, RVs and uh, by, checking, by checking the planned RVs. Another thing I would talk about in terms of due diligence more widely than compliance is there have been sharp practices by SEV providers in this region. So I would encourage you, if you're calling an offshore terminal, that to check the security arrangements with that terminal in advance. So Nigerian offshore terminals and Cameroonian offshore terminals are secured. We recommend that SEVs disengage while the client vessel is under the protection of terminal security. Now, an SEV may remain on standby to save um, the, the rate or the time to demobilize and mobilize for an outbound voyage. Um, but normally, mobilization from, say, Port Harcourt or Lagos takes no more than two calendar days. And some providers, OK, may, may require some notice. But we've seen in this case, this image shows a Pennington Terminal. Uh, this is Pennington Terminal here. You can see it's terminal exclusion boundary here. There's a client vessel at the terminal. Terminal security in yellow, providing um, security to other parts of the infrastructure around Pennington as well. But this uh, terminal security provided by two or three um, patrol vessels um, was inside the terminal exclusion zone 
Um, as far as we can tell, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yet in this case, an SEV was also in the area and charged this client over 40 days worth of, um, uh, of, of over 40 days of providing an SEV when they were loading at Pennington, which is a particularly slow terminal to load at. What we would say in this case is you should have disengaged the SEV um, once you reached Pennington and demobilised that SEV. That SEV would have then either gone back to Port Harcourt or up to Lagos. And then you'd give them some notice when you thought the loading was um, coming to its completion. They would have then remobilised, got out to you in, in one or two days, and then they would take you uh, away from Pennington once you're ready. Also, what we see um, are some other sharp practices. So we strongly recommend that your SEV contract should include an SEV AIS clause. So we have seen SEV providers reassure charterers of the SEV that the SEV has departed the terminal when they actually haven't departed the terminal. An outrageous case happened in 2021. A broker informed an LPG carrier that its SEV was on its way to them, uh, but then the SEV failed to show up. The charterer contacted the broker. The broker informed them that the SEV had been attacked en route and that a naval rating had been killed on board. Actually, the SEV had never departed. The SEV master refused to sail that SEV because only five, not seven Nigerian Navy personnel were boarded onto the SEV and the Navy personnel were not carrying the weapons. So the master said, I'm not going out there uh, unarmed. Good for him. You can avoid uh, having the, 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 the cloak put in front of your eyes uh, if SEVs um, display their AIS and you can double check that the SEV really is on its way. SEVs should be at the RV ahead of time and should be able to check that the RV position is safe to RV in. Also, um, another good practice is to use intelligence to identify safer places to RV and release armed security. So a, um, a problem that I have with the industry generally is that um, they're very lazy uh, when it comes to some engagements. Um, you'll see here that there is a position three north, three east, and it's about 200 nautical miles from Lagos. And it's often used by um, SEVs and clients calling, calling Lagos. Um, and yet it is highly predictable. And we've seen pirates attack vessels before and after that position. And that's why we have a higher risk area here in that position, because we've seen incidents there. So I would, I would urge you, please try and avoid predictable RVs. And there are things which we can do on particular cases on a tactical level to change up the RV and release positions and make it look as if you're going somewhere else and then change course prior to that. Now what I'll do is I'll hand over to Steve for Kidnap for Ransom Response. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, yes, I, so I run our um, Kidnap for Ransom Response out of Ambry. Um, the team and I have worked together for um, just over 10 years now. Um, in 2020, we did eight cases. Um, in 2021, we've done four so far. Uh, and this year, we've been already approached about a, 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 in, a incident that just happened just after um, um, Christmas time. So we are very, very current as a team. I think that um, is very important. And as we are seeing changes in, in the way that the pirates are conducting their operations, we too are looking at ways that we can um, assist um, the, the seafaring community. We only concentrate on marine kidnapping for ransom. We don't concentrate on other areas. And that gives us a, 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 a laser guided focus on uh, as a team on what we're trying to do when we're approached to do a case. If we look at the Tonsberg case, this is actually still ongoing at this moment in time. Um, the pirates, when they hooked the ladder on the rail, it took them three seconds from the point of them actually lifting the ladder off the, um, the skiff 
to hook in it onto the rail and they breached the barbed wire almost immediately. From that point to getting to the bridge, it took the first pirate 36 seconds. So from the, the, the lower deck to the bridge wing, 36 seconds. All pirates had no shoes uh, and they were able to, to, to find crew very, very quickly. So if the crew have not seen the pirates um, come alongside, and the first time that they see a pirate is when they're um, on the on the deck, then actually trying to get to the citadel is going to be an extremely difficult um, endeavour. Taking into consideration that the pirates have only got to get one crew member, and then the pressure is on the rest of the crew to come come to the bridge or a muster point uh, of, of the pirate of the of the pirates and, and choosing. Um, sorry, goes on. So. What do I have at my fingertips to support you guys? Well, first and foremost, we're intelligence led, and I think that speaks volumes from um, and Robert's um, presentation so far. I get a lot of closed source information, as you would expect. Um, I hear a lot of things. I have to discount some of those the, 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 those elements that are happening in in, in the, uh, the Niger Delta. But um, we have a end-to-end -end service and that is completely end-to-end -end. and what i mean that is, is 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 from the moment that the incident takes place i have the ability i have eight scvs at my disposal from west africa that the closest one i can move towards to support you if you if you're in an incident um i've got a large team that sits underneath me as i've said we've worked together for 10 years which makes things so easy because we all know each other's jobs everybody knows where we need to be and we continually are training to become the best we can possibly be to deliver the best product that we can give should one of these incidents take place. Um, we monitor how things are happening in Nigeria. Um, in 2020, there was, a, there was an issue with um, liquidity of funds, which meant that you couldn't get large amounts of money out of the bank. So we had to look at other ways of doing that. So we're, I suppose the point I'm trying to make really is that we're constantly evolving and trying to match what are um, the difficulties that you have, not just with the, 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 the pirates and their capabilities, but also the, the, the infrastructure that you're working with in, in Nigeria. One of the questions I get asked quite regularly by ship owners um, is how can we have you as our crisis responder? And I often say it's pretty easy, really. You've only got to go to your insurance broker um, and say that when you're you're having a single transit or whether you're redoing your annual policy, um, that all you need to do is instruct the insurance broker to have Amber named. We are known by all 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 Lloyd's of London market. Um, most of the underwriters who, who write kidnap for ransom insurance know me personally. Um, and if it and if it comes from the customer, we'll be on, and you'll get everything that's on that list. Uh, and, and I think it's it's a pretty powerful thing because, as I say, we are a mariner's supporting um, enabler. Um, and I know marine um, crisis as well as any as, as well as any of my contemporaries. That's for certain. Um, the next slide really gives you a um, a phased approach. Uh, everything we have to do has to have a a, a level of of uh, process. Um, even the pirates have a process. You might not think it, but they are they are very process driven in the way that they go about their um, their communications with us and lots of other other, other, other parts of their um, business model, if you will. So we have a, a five phase approach. It's um, on the board there for everybody to to, to read and see. Um, and it's it, it, as I say, it's been built over a long period of time that allows us to be able to um, pivot if we need to should the pirates decide to do something strange or, 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 or different. Um, at the moment, we're conducting all cases remotely um, and there's been no change in our ability to be able to support a customer. Um, and that's obviously down to the, 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 the ongoing COVID issues that we're, we're seeing. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, I, I mean, from, 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 from the takeaway from, from me, it, it really here is, um, I'm happy to speak to any one of you um, at any time. Um, I'm very easily contactable um, and, and to be able to talk about uh, um, not only the crisis training for you guys within your crisis management teams,
but also um, the wider um, issues that are going on in the Gulf of Guinea. I'm, I'm a resource at Ambry and I'm a resource to be used by um, the shipping, shipping community. Um, so into the final section, what else is going on in the Gulf of Guinea um, in terms of piracy? Um, so in terms of security availability, I've already touched on this. Uh, the availability and price of security differs very much um, country to country. Um, so, for example, off Benin, you can only um, engage a naval patrol boat up to 50 nautical miles from the Cotonou breakwater, and others require significant advance notice, such as the Togolese. Um, the threat areas, as you can see here in the uh, map, extend beyond areas where security, uh, armed security is available. Um, and in terms of the uh, prices, I've shown a chart to the left here. Unfortunately, I can't give away our prices, but um, the prices are dramatically different country to country. Um, an Equatorial Ghanaian frigate could be as much as five times as expensive as a Nigerian SEB on a daily rate, for example. Um, and the Ghanaian gunboat may be a third more expensive than a Togolese gunboat, uh, but it can escort you fully out of our HRA. Um, my key takeaway here is, of course, in reality, um, some clients will be restricted in what they can purchase in terms of armed security. And so it can be more cost effective in reducing risk to invest in your BMP um, to embark a maritime security liaison officer to an unarmed person with experience implementing BMP, enhancing the watch, drilling the crew. Uh, and or engaging Ambre Guardian, where we can get you onto a lower risk route in the first place, and we can monitor ahead of that route for any unusual activity or instance and redirect you as appropriate. Provide advice if you see something suspicious, like we've done, um, we've done a few times now. Um, in terms of uh, Lagos secure anchorage area, I've heard that there have been lots of questions about this over the course of the year. So in January, this was disbanded by NAMASA, and um, the Nigerian Navy instructed the operator OMS to um, disband, um, to cease operations with the SAA. Um, the Nigerian Navy then took over full responsibility for securing the Nigerian Ports Authority Anchorage. And they do patrol the Anchorage area. We see that on AIS. And there are usually several SEVs in that area, in that general area. However, because of the ruling around the SAA, and um, SEVs cannot offer their own SAA by another name. Um, they pick up and drop off clients only when they get to Lagos. The Nigerians have also invested millions of dollars in the Deep Blue project, which you may have heard of. Um, they've made several large capital investments, including some offshore patrol vessels, and these have been used offshore Lagos and they're based there. Um, they've also recently announced further investments in training and maintenance. And this this was launched in June. Um, I think what you'll see is you'll see um, results in the medium term. I don't think we'll see uh, significant changes in the short term. Um, the Nigerian Navy has been, ta has been successfully uh, taking over security at Lagos. There have been no kidnappings or hijackings at Lagos since. And there haven't actually been any kidnappings or hijackings reported at Lagos since 2015. There are significant, and, and this speaks to the complexity of the challenge for Nigeria, and there are a significant number of groups involved in piracy and armed maritime crime in the Niger Delta. And, and you can see here in uh, red in the Niger Delta, you can see concentrations of where they are um, operating from. So you can see that they're operating from Delta State, Bielsa State, Rivers State, Aqua Ibom and Cross Rivers State. Um, so this is a complex problem. This is a big problem and it will take time to resolve. Now, in terms of some initiatives which have um, been announced this year, uh, BIMCO's uh, the Gulf of Guinea Declaration on the Suppression of Piracy. Um, we've been speaking to clients and they really do feel that this has coalesced, particularly in Europe, a political response. Um, that has seen, for example, international warship deployments and the EU's coordinated maritime presence. So the CMP, which I, I mentioned, um, this gives visibility of national deployments to the Gulf of Guinea region of warships, um, but it isn't a coordinated guarantee 
that there will be a European warship there all the time. Also, what was announced was uh, Shade. So uh, they're working through existing mechanisms, such as the Yaoundé Code of Conduct. They're looking to, it, to strengthen that through increased information sharing, um, response coordination, and national counter piracy legislation, legal infrastructure advice to each other. I'll come on to that in just a, just a minute as well. So Ghana is also working on that, but we've seen some developments in Togo and, and Nigeria on that. There have been several international deployments. Um, the most impactful recent one has been that of the HDMS Esbern snare, the Danish. Um, obviously with the arrests of the suspected pirates. However, of course, these need to be these deployments need to be um, hand in hand with transfer agreements. So, for example, with the Esbern snare, unfortunately, they've had to release three of those um, suspected pirates um, back into the region because they couldn't secure those tra that transfer for prosecution into the region. And I think something which isn't mentioned often enough is the Portuguese uh, commitment to Sao Tom and Principe. We've seen the NRP there, their warship there, uh, respond to several incidents. Um, there are signs that legal frameworks could work. So in Nigeria, they brought in the Suppression of Piracy and Other Maritime Offences Act in 2019, and they have prosecuted pirates under this. And those pirates um, were responsible for hijacking a, a commercial fishing vessel, and they received 12-year prison sentences and fines. And in Togo, you've also seen uh, the authorities there arrest and prosecute pirates successfully. So, for example, the hijacking of the G Donna 1 in 2019, those pirates were sentenced to 12 to 15 years imprisonment um, this year as well. Now we come to questions and answers. Hopefully we've left some time for that. No, it's ideal. Thank you uh, very much, Rob and Steve. Has anybody got any questions? You can either type them in or now, now the presentation's finished, feel free to uh, to unmute yourself and uh, and uh, speak away. I've uh, I've got a, a, a quick question, Rob, to, to get things going. It, it was clear that best management practice, the, the BMP, uh, and the layers, if if put in place, it's about buying time so that guys like yourself or SEVs can get out there. And and you discussed a few instances of of poor practice, should we say, not not putting things out correctly, even though efforts uh, to an extent were made. Are we still seeing plenty of instances though where zero efforts are made towards vessel hardening at all? Uh, I I haven't seen any cases where zero hardening. Has, has taken place. Um, so sometimes you see images of barbed wire where literally it is around a single railing um, and it seems more like a tick in the box exercise. Right. Uh, but uh, we, we conduct surveys with our Guardian vessels and usually they're coming back with 50 to 70 percent um, adherence to BMP pr principles which we feel are really significant. Okay, that's uh, that's good. Have you have you seen any effects? Um, you talked about low numbers for 2020 or lower numbers. Uh, is there any effects on COVID uh, for that? Do you think or or not? Uh, yeah, I don't think COVID has had really had an impact, but it hasn't had an impact on the um, the pirates. Um, a lass of fever and malaria in the jungle is is a is a far bigger issue. Um, I, I think to the degree that the pirates are part of criminal syndicate gangs and they will they, they will deploy when they need to deploy. They may have other activities going on at the time, such as oil smuggling, grain smuggling, um, gun running, drug running. Um, you know, that, 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 that there's a lot of things that they're doing. So um, we, we've often seen on cases, John, where, they, where they've actually parked us, if you will, for a, a, a week where there's been complete silence where they've gone off and done another activity. And we found out later on through intelligence means that they were shipping a lot of refined um, commodity to be to be sold on the black market. And that was more lucrative and that needed to be done at that particular time. They got the, the crew and they were holding them for they knew they'd got them and they, it was a banker, if you will. Um, so, no, not really. It's been more of an issue, the COVID pandemic um, for 
actual face-to-face -face crisis management training and actually solution-based. We've had to really think out, out the box and use technology a lot more, which, which uh, again, we've been able to do. So. Excellent. Thanks. A lot of people on this call, obviously, piracy and maritime security is their number one priority, but my understanding is that it's fairly low down the priority list, um, given the other issues out in places like Nigeria. Um, so yes, yeah, yeah. Legal exactly. fishing, for example, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's the certain certain things that do raise um, a lot higher on the on the Nigerian governmental spectrum than, 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 than piracy, unfortunately. Um, and that's just, just, you know, just how it is. Um, uh, you know, there's, I can't really comment too much more on that, but it, it, it is, it, it's not as high as um, we would like it to be, shall we say. Yeah, yeah understood. Um, if if a member was to uh, contract with an SEV, um, obviously uh, not an AMRE one, but uh, if they were to contact with one and the, and the paperwork and checks and balances that you mentioned in your presentation weren't in place, um, what kind of repercussions may they may they find thrust upon themselves um, if that was the case? They, they, they run the risk of being fined and having a detention. Um, so we've seen uh, in previous years where um, vessels have taken uh, Nigerian, uh, embarked Nigerian Navy armed guards on board, they've been detained for months, two to three months. So quite a significant business hit then. Um, OK, has anybody else got any questions? We've got a... Uh... A couple of minutes left. Uh, please feel free to speak up. Don't be shy. Um, give you a couple of seconds there to to think about it if you want. Could get away lightly here, Steve and Rob. <laughs> okay. Well, if uh, nobody has any questions, I'd uh, just before we leave, uh, once again, like to thank uh, Rob and Steve and the team at Ambre for their time. Uh, and the update, which uh, which I found very interesting. So thanks very much, guys. And uh, just to point out that uh, Steve uh, and Rob and the team are, of course, uh, contactable directly, or you can email myself or loss.prevention at nepia.com should you have any questions or, or want to get in touch with these guys via us. That's no problem at all. The recording will be sent out to all the people that registered. And uh, we will include contact details for Steve and Rob and the team in that email. So thanks very much to everybody who attended. I know that you're all very busy people, so it's uh, it's good to see you all. And uh, once again, uh, Steve, Rob, thanks very much. Thank you, John. Thank thanks you very much. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.